G'day and welcome to the Build Me A Brewery podcast. My name is Chris Hayton and this is part two of the raw materials and ingredient supplies segment. In this episode, I head up to Newcastle's Foghorn Brewhouse to meet up with National Sales Manager Michael Capaldo from Hop Products Australia to discuss the supply side of things when it comes to hops, a crucial ingredient when it comes to your beer. Similar to Hayden, Michael is well placed to share his advice when it comes to hop supply, having been on both sides of the table as brewer and now sales and supply of hops to the industry. Having started out as a fellow home brewer, he then landed a job as a packaging assistant at Little Creatures and then as a production brewer at Gage Roads during their big growth phase and then finally getting the opportunity to craft his own beer recipes as head brewer at Lovedale and Sydney Brewery. Having won awards and medals for their beers, Michael then felt the need for a new challenge making the jump over the hop supply side of the table at HPA. Michael shares some great advice to aspiring and established brewery owners when it comes to setting up hop contracts, recipe design and much more. And just a heads up, I've tried my best to clean up the background noise from sitting in the middle of a yet again a busy tap room at Foghorn. Uh, This was a a very early episode in the podcast series I recorded, so lessons have been learned once again in regards to maximizing the audio quality for you all. So let's crack on. I hope you enjoy my chat with Michael Capaldo from HPA. Welcome, Michael Capaldo. How are you today, mate? I'm good. How are you? Yeah, very good, and I appreciate you taking some time out of your day to meet me here at Foghorn. Um, Great brew house here, and... You're here with your black tea, and I'm here with my parallel, so... Uh... I've got to drive home. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I do appreciate your time, and just to kick things off, I've given the audience a bit of a short introduction about yourself and your history in the in the brewing community, but if you want to give the audience a bit of a, a rundown on your craft beer roots, what you were doing before HPA, and, and as well as what you were doing before you entered the brewing industry. Sure. Um, before I entered the brewing industry, I had a home-delivered fresh fruit and vegetable business so that was that was me for a few years out of uni um, and while I was running this business a mate of mine gave me a kit a kilo and a 20 20 litre fermenter as has happened to many people in this industry and said you might like this Michael and then uh, I went nuts and brewed and brewed and brewed like a nutcase went to all grain reasonably quickly but not before I had just with kit and kilo I had nine taps in the house a tractable tap that could reach anywhere in the kitchen so it was a pretty cool batch pad um, then I decided I wanted to you know make it into a career so moved to WA did a graduate diploma in um, in brewing science at Edith Cowan University under the instruction of the great Hugh Dunn and uh, got a job as a yard hand at Little Creatures so high pressure to clean but what was then Schwartz Brewery which later morphed into Sydney Brewery and then Lovedale Brewery, uh, and then back to Sydney Brewery. Um, and I was the head brewer there for seven and a half years or so before moving to Hop Products Australia to sell hops. Yeah, wow, so quite a, a journey across the industry. And um, uh, I know that uh, reading up on yourself uh, when you were at Sydney Brewery in Lovedale, you, you know, your beers won many awards, especially in, in, within the first 12 months of your um, you know, operation and all that. So. Um, how are those guys doing these Man, days? They're nailing it. They're winning yeah. trophies left, right and centre. The, mm. the Surrey Hills Pills, um, I think last year, was it was prolific. It, and, you know, this is this is two years after I've left, so they're nailing it. Mm. I think it won AIBA, trophy at AIBA, uh, trophy at Sydney Royal and trophy at the Indies. Like, that's 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 the trifecta. I don't know any other beer that did that yeah. or that's done that for that matter. So they're doing great and they're winning. They're, they're just doing beautiful things. Yeah, excellent. So... And uh, I guess what um, attracted you to make the jump from brewing to the supply side, so HBA, the hops, hop selling side? Um, it's pretty interesting. I guess I get curious and then I satisfy my curiosity and then I get curious for something else and for growth. Um, I love running a brewery. Um, as a head brewer, you uh, your destiny is, is, you know, linked very closely to the ambitions of the owner of the brewery and Jerry had really good ambitions uh, and I had good ambitions but they were just different uh, our, our paths were were growing apart when I say Jerry the owner of Sydney Brewery so I applied for the job at HPA and I got it which was great um, 
and yeah, it's, it's been a good move for me because it's 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 it is a career change. Um, it is different when you're a brewer. You are um, you know you're focused on quality. You focus focus on output. Focus on staff. Focus on safety. Um, you don't necessarily have the time. I, I really, as a brewer, didn't spend that much time focusing on hop quality or hop contracts or hop supply or, or, or working out you know what are the chains of custody or you know what what is this what is this how whole what is the holistic side of this industry so moving into it's been cool yeah excellent. it's a fascinating agri- all of a sudden you go from production and fast moving consumer goods to working for a farming entity and it's very different perspectives on everything yeah and I guess um, I guess the uh, advantage that you would have is coming from that other side of the table you know being the consumer of, of HPA products and mm. you know understanding of you know that side of you know, the hops going into the boil and how they sort of work with each other but being able to sell on that side for, on the HPA sense of, of things is, is probably pretty crucial to um, to what you do currently so it is and mm. to be fair all of our state reps um, we've got state reps in Queensland Victoria um, New South Wales which is myself WA and Tassie and we're all former head brewers so we we We've, we've done our time, we understand what the brewer needs, um, which is cool, you know, not just from a hop perspective, but, you know, we can help you with your filler, we can help you with this, you know, your filter, or your beer quality. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's fun because you don't lose your old skills, you build on them. Yeah, yeah, excellent. And uh, can you give the, the listeners, I mean, I'm sure that a lot of people know HPA, one of the, the biggest... Uh, growers and suppliers in the Australian market for, for hops, but uh, can you give us a bit of rundown on, on the history of HPA and, and the role in the industry? Sure. Um, the history is pretty long, man. Um, Bushy Park, I think it was William Shoebridge who brought uh, English or brought hops across from England in the 1820s and didn't actually start up Bushy Parks until the 1860s. I think it was 1867 Bushy Park was started. And we're, we're still farming that exact land there, which is amazing. So it's it's got to be one of the longest producing hop farms in the world. Um, a lot of our acreage uh, these days is grown in Victoria around Bright and Myrtleford, which is just a, another... Both, both of our hop farms are just in incredible areas of nature. Mm. But that was, um, the hop gardens over there were started by William Panlook, um, who was a Chinese immigrant who'd come over, and he found his fortune in, in growing hops. Um, and his, his blacksmith was actually the grandfather of Alan Monshing, who is our current farm manager. So, like, there's generations yeah. and generations uh, still attached to that farm from, from when it was started. So, it's, yeah, pretty cool. Because the majority of uh, Australia's hops are grown on the eastern seaboard, is that right? Well, we grow um, all of our hops on the eastern seaboard. Yeah. Um, I don't just want to talk about HPA. There is a holistic yep. industry and it's wicked. Um, but we produce about 90% of Australia's hops and all of our hops are produced on the eastern seaboard. So, yeah. yeah. Could you share some simple thoughts on, on how the hops are actually harvested or, or grown and then and then you know gone from farm to glass? Sure. So let's start off with what, a hop, what hops are. Hops are a perennial plant, meaning they, they produce the hop cone once a year. Um, they start from a rhizome base, so rhizome is like a root structure. You'll find it in um, uh, the canna lily. You'll find it in, um, uh, in, in a lot of grass. Uh, you'll find it in, uh, what's that stuff the pandas eat again? Bamboo. Bamboo, there you go. <laughs> so simple as a thing. Um, and that sprouts out once a year. It's basically got several phases of growth. The first is, let's say, the, the biomass growth, if you're, you're talking in beer, so it grows tall. Um, and then on the uh, summer equinox, its very uh, uh, its growth phases are very much dependent on the light phase. So it'll grow nice and tall, and then come the summer um, uh, solstice, it'll understand that the days are going from getting longer to getting shorter, so then it, it, it starts to uh, spread its laterals, which are like its arms, and then from there it will develop little flowers and cones. And those cones develop into fully fledged hop cones. Um, the actual plant itself really bushes out from being a stringy little vine to being really thick and bushy. It's about six metres tall. Um, and it's the, the aroma coming off these things is awesome. Like they are rich in essential oils and all these other wonderful things. So you walk through a hop field and it's it's, it's incredible. 
It's, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a beer, beer dream, you know. So, so do you get the, the similar sort of smells as you would expect of when it's, you know, in a final product, like a beer or...? No, it's no? it's different and it's it's bigger and better. I mean, it's like, there's just so much of this awesomeness in the air. It's euphoric. Right? There's, it's so sensory and then, you know, you pick up these cones and you rip them in half and there is just so much aroma to them. It's, it's, it's really cool. And how many hops exactly does HPA produce? We've got uh, we've got quite a few proprietary varieties. So Ella, Enigma, Galaxies, uh, our big one, Topaz, and Big Secret. And we have uh, our newest hop, which is HPA 016, which will be released uh, this time next month. When, when's this podcast getting aired? Oh, probably in a month's time. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. it's going to have a name then. I'll let you. I'll let you wait. But we're um. We're really busy working hard on getting the launch right. Um, we were going to launch it earlier in the year in Good Beer Week, um, and we're really looking forward to having a big party, and then COVID came along and spoiled a lot of people's parties. So we, we put it off because COVID was just, we did not know what was happening. We put the launch off, and uh, we're looking forward to, um, to launching it. Around the good, uh, around the time that the Indies uh, Awards happen, so because I think this is the same hop you were talking to Matt Kierkegaard on Radio Brews News about. Uh, is that right? Zero. I is could it have zero been. I, I don't. I don't listen to myself. No, nah, um, no. Nah, I, I hear think, myself that was talking. Back in 2018, because yeah. uh, I, I probably would have been because it was. Yeah. It, it's, it's a massive project. Like 016 has been in our breeding program for the last 16 years. Yeah. And if you have a chat to Simon Whitting, who's our, our hop breeder. Uh, he thinks that anything less than that isn't particularly responsible. So actually getting a, commercialising a hop varietal is a massive deal for a hop farmer. So if I was talking about anything two years ago, it was, it was still 016. Yeah. And uh, yeah, because the average time it takes for a hop to, you know, come to market can be 10 plus years. Is that, is that right? Yeah. So again, this is more Simon's area, but... Um, you know, there's so many factors in determining what's going to be a great hop from a commercial perspective. So, you know, first of all, you have to figure out the agronomics of it. You know, what's it yield like? And just because you get a good yield one year, it doesn't mean you're going to get a good yield the next year. So you've got to figure out your agronomics. You've got to figure out your yields, you know, and that, that can take seven, eight, nine years. And then all of a sudden you go, okay, you know, commercially it looks like it's viable. I might want to turn, you know, one vine or one plant into... 5,000 hectares one day or something like that, you know? And then you've got to go, okay, what's it actually smell like and taste like? So then we'll start doing sensory on it. Um, and there's already a lot of data collected. And I think anything that's not winning on the data side isn't even going to get to the flavour and the aroma side these days. It never used to be that way. There are some, some incredible hops out there in the market that really are not fantastic yielders. Uh, that wouldn't make it through modern day breeding programs. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, then when you get into the latter stage, it's about what hops have you got in your breeding program that are banging that, and, and that the craft brewer is looking for. Sorry, not that the craft brewer, that every brewer in the world is looking for. So we supply from macro, the largest brewer in the world, to, to the smallest brewer in the world and everyone in between. Everyone's looking for great hops to make their beer with. Um, so you've got to figure out what's going to be a hop that's going to be, one, wanted by the brewer, but two, what's a hop that is going to be accepted by the consumer? Because there's no point in having a hop that brewers absolutely love and then they go and make the beer and they sell it to the sell it to the consumer and the consumer doesn't want to buy a, a second one because they just don't dig it that much. So ultimately it's got to be consumerly accepted by the consumer. Yeah, absolutely. And, and quick question, what, sh- what is your favourite hop? Oh man, that's Fox. like... That's a tough question. Like, you know... Naming your favourite child or... Uh, I, don't, I don't do that either. <laughs> no, they, they hate me when I do that. Um... Oh, it depends on the beer, man. Like, uh, you know, Galaxy's a wonderful hop. I love it because it's fresh, it's crisp, it's easy to drink. I think my favourite is probably Enigma that's in our range. Enigma's a really unique hop. It's, I think it's the most unique hop that we've got in our range. It's, it's got some dankness, some resinous, some pineness, but it's got some really subtle, like, melon and white grape to it. Um, yeah, I, it, it can really infuriate me with how tasty it can be. So, yeah, that's... Yeah. Enigma it is. There you go. You drew it Excellent. out of me. Um, and then you guys actually also have a, I don't know if it's been new, newly introduced, but a, the hop spectrum, is that right? Yeah, the, the hop flavour spectrum is, let's call it a guideline um, for what brewers could get out of the beer. I mean, there are so many factors to go, that go into what is a hop going to 
how is a hop going to impact your beer? The hop flavour spectrum is literally a result of thousands of conversations and emails and beer tastings along the way. Um, one, but also two, we've, uh, we are, like we touched, you touched on earlier, we're part of the Bar Pass Group, which is the largest hop trading and growing company in the world. We have some incredible sensory uh, facilities and, and people in our group. So the hop flavour spectrum is, is feedback from our brewers and it also incorporates some of that more technical analysis uh, from our trained sensory team to, to come up with a sort of a, a map and when a brewer looks at it, they go, okay, this is this has got you know a little bit more um, floral, a bit more fruit, a little less pine wood. That's the kind of hop I'm looking for to put into my IPA, for example. So, mm. yeah. Okay, excellent. And do you serve any other industries other than the brewing community? Not particularly. Um, I think there's scope out there. It's, there is a little bit of um, the pharmaceutical side of things but really for sleep aids or whatever and it's not it's not a part of our business no. at this stage so purely we, just the brewing just, industry, just brewing industry. Yep. okay excellent and the main reason i wanted to get you on michael is you know we've been talking to a, a number of people in the brewing community mostly brewery owners and, and people on the financing side and the business setup side but i guess brewery owners need to be aware of you know where they're going to get their products from to make good quality beer so i guess just giving our listeners a bit of a an insight on what it what it's like dealing with hop suppliers or you know we uh, earlier episode had hayden Lockie from gladfield on talking about the malt side so maybe if you want to shed some um you know thoughts on you know hop contracts with brewery owners and what you know, is there a standardised sort of hot contract between a new brewery, or just just shed some some light around some of those topics? That's a pretty pretty complex question. Mm. Uh, you've 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 asked me, so let's unpack it in segments, yep. and, and feel free to come back to me and, and yep. ask little bits. So, hops are the most, in my opinion, anyway, in my biased opinion, the most vital and you know flavour impactful part of beer. You know. Malts are extremely important, yeast are, water profile is, but hops can really be the game changer, especially in these hop forward beers that people are brewing and that people are drinking, consuming. And that is part of your brand. Now, a lot of the big impactful hops out there, let's look at Australian ones, would be Galaxy, would be Big Secret, 016 will be in that discussion. Um, if we're looking at a global perspective, you'd be looking at Citra and Mosaic, being in that same circle, just, just big bang hops that brew great beers. Now, as the as demand for craft beer has increased, output of beers with these hops has also increased, and there's been massive demand put on the farm gate for these hops, and they're just not always there. Now, you've got to remember we're talking about a 16... We're talking about how slow agriculture moves, and the other side, look how fast the consumer can change its mind. So it's very difficult for agriculture to keep up with consumer trends, which is essentially what's been this incredible uptake in craft beer over the last, let's say, 10 years, just to define the most recent period. So um, it is vital that you communicate with your hop supplier uh, constantly. I really, I mean, like I said, we deal with all size of brewers. If you, even if you're a small guy and you're going from, or a small girl, going from, you know, 500 litres sales a year to 5,000 litres sales a year, or, or 5 million to 10 million a year, you need to constantly communicate because you, you have to keep your, your representatives there to work for you as well, uh, and you have to make them, um, make sure that you get what you need. So, um, when you get to hop contracts, I guess every supplier has a different, a slightly different model that fits them. Um... HPA operates in with two basic mechanisms. One is the contracting mechanism and the other is the spot market mechanism. So contracting is, um, is basically a result of us being a farm gate. So I am an employee of an agricultural company, as is everyone at HPA. Our number one priority is to sell the farm gate. If you don't sell the stuff you grow, you're not going to make money, you're not going to be profitable, you're not going to sustain the farm. So uh, what contracting does is it gives surety to the farmer that they will sell their crop. Now, in the case of HPA, what we do is, with uh, hops, uh, what we'd like to do is if you order, for example, 2021 uh, crop of, um, uh, let's say, what's a good hop to talk about for next year? Um, 
Ella. Let's say Ella, right? Let's say you want to order Ella now. It, next year, it's got a certain price. But if you say to me, Mike, I want to order some Ella in 2022 and 2023 as well. Now, I won't be paying for it until then, but I want to lock in my amount. What we'll do is we'll offer you a sliding scale of pricing. So it'll actually go down a little bit because you're committing to us so far out. We appreciate that. We'll give you the extra price advantage. Um, that guarantees us, before we even stand the crop up, that it's sold, okay? And that contract, you have to remember, like we will try and be uh, flexible with contracts where we can. You always have to remember that if you're entering into a contract, it is a binding agreement until one party decides to be flexible with the other. So generally we are, but over contracting can be really bad, uh, especially if your hop supplier is long. If they have too much hops, let's say they've got too much Galaxy, and you've got too much Galaxy and you say, hey, uh, can you help us out? It's like, well, we've, we've got to sort ourselves out and you said you were going to buy this. You made a commitment to buy this. So responsible contracting is really important um, and that's a responsibility of both the rep and the, the, the brewer. Um, the other second mechanism is the spot market mechanism and that's coming in and buying what we've got on the cupboard. So the spot market is hops that uh, have already been harvested, so they've already been grown, they've already been processed, they're in pellets, they're in cool room. So we've all, HPA has already foot the cost of doing all the growing and all the packaging. Uh, so you're going to pay a little bit more for it because it's about deciding today about that you want availability and getting the hops you know, that week. So there are many advantages to contract for, con- contracting forward, basically. So with a, a new or aspiring brewery, what advice would you give them when they're, they're starting to dial in a core range, right? Mm. Um, you know, they're probably experimenting, doing a lot of piloting. Um, when, when would you recommend a brewery to start maybe engaging into a hot contract or, or, or you know, locking something in that's more, I guess, cement so they can make sure that they're getting the same sort of hops um, for, for their core range? Yeah. I reckon before you get in a contract, you have a discussion. So if, you, if you're starting off a brewery, you want to make sure, you know, so the first thing you do is you start off a brewery, you develop some beers. Let's say you develop a pale ale and you've got, uh, you've got some great hops in there and it's banging. Now, there's no point in scaling up and doing graphics and artwork and all that sort of thing for then hops that just aren't going to be available that year. So have a chat to your hop supplier and say, what am I going to be able to get my hands on if I contract, you know, soon enough? And then they'll tell you, yep, you can get A, B, C, D. This one here is going to be tough. Make a decision. Then put your finger on a responsible amount of contracts as soon as you get the chance to, especially if they're very in-demand hops. You know, if, you, if your hop supplier says, you know, you'll be right for the first few brews, just get it in make sure you're happy. But if they're really in-demand hops, you, you've got to get a contract in straight away. Um, and the benefit, I've talked about the price benefit uh, of contracts, but the real benefit I reckon to breweries is supply surety. That's the real benefit of contract. It means that if you develop that cracking pale ale or IPA or, 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 or whatever, you're actually going to be able to keep brewing it and your customer's going to be able to become loyal to that flavour and that brand. So, yeah, that's my answer in a nutshell. Yeah, yeah, so making sure that you've got a fan base there and um, it's something that you want to brew consistently and, and constantly, so lock in something that's more long-term. Yeah, there's actually a really good article, um, a lady called Terry Farrandorf, who's, who's she's the founder of the Pink Boots Society, um, but she used to be a brewer before... Well, she, she ran breweries for a very long time and she's run an awesome article on... She's written an awesome article on hop contracting um, that's completely independent. So anyone looking to um, start a brewery, have a look at that. But basically, you know, if you haven't got a signature on a piece of paper, you haven't got a hop contract. And if you haven't got a hop contract, you can come up... You can have a verbal agreement with the nicest guy in the world that he's going to give you, you know, 500 kilos of citra next year, no problem, this is the price. But then when you go to get it, and it's not there because you haven't signed a piece of paper and they haven't offered you a piece of paper to sign on, you miss out. Don't miss out if it's important to you. Yeah. Yeah. And what what's HBA's philosophy or, uh, I guess, what's your engagement with the brewing community on developing recipes? So if... Uh, you know, they are wanting to tweak a beer or they're trying to get a certain flavour profile, would would someone from HPA you know, provide assistance on you know, trying to get that flavour profile out of what they're looking for? We'll provide like consultative advice at every and any stage. So, mm-hmm. um, like I said, we've all been head brewers for a long time. 
uh, before we came into this role. So a, a lot of our discussions aren't based around hop contracts. They're based around things like recipe formulation like. And we can certainly help, you know, especially when you need to substitute a hop, for example. You know, you might say, oh, man, you know, uh, I need to replace topaz. I've run out of topaz. You haven't got any available. What's good? Well, Vic Secret's a great substitute. Fantastic. So we can talk from that side. Um, but we do a lot of... Uh, we help a lot of people with their... They make the decisions, but we, we certainly give them the best advice we can. We do a lot of it. Yeah. And uh, you mentioned that we talked about the hop spectrum before, and I know Baha's website, they've got you know a pretty good library of different hops that talk about the flavours they give off and the flavour profiles and all that. Anything you'd sort of suggest to listeners about... Um, you know, tools they can use maybe online or things that you've learned from the industry to you know, for recipe design or inspiration um, okay recipe design and inspiration okay um, can we step back a bit with that as well and just look at hop yep. quality to start with make sure you know what your hops are you know don't just go oh I've heard Galaxy and Citra bangers um, I'll brew a beer with it understand what they taste like and smell like if you're starting out you know there are some great homebrew shops out there that a, a very astute buyers of hops and um, you know buy yourself a small sample of the hop you want and give it a rub and a sniff understand it understand what it's going to do to your beer um, maybe even get some pellets and chuck them in a you know a, a very generic lager for example understand what it's going to do that's yeah that's a good good way to start um, what was the rest of your question about uh, well I guess yeah just uh, inspiration behind beers but I think we're, we've, we've covered that um, you know, I know that a lot of breweries will you know have a small little homebrew pilot system that they'll try new hops in and, um, and, and trying to I guess get an idea before they brew it on a commercial scale so w- what you're saying is try you know, I've even done myself single hop beers like smash beers just to see what Citra might taste like and what Galaxy would mm-hmm. taste like so that's basically where you're coming from is that right? Yeah absolutely yeah. Yeah. Alright excellent and just on hop storage and handling I know I've always been told to make sure that if you can if you can vac seal them great if you mm-hmm. can make sure it's in a cold environment anything that you would you know, advise to a new brewery sure there's a lot of advice we recently released a, a blog post on this um, and there is if you if you're new to the industry or if you're experienced in the industry we've, if you go to the uh, Hot Products Australia website we've actually got a quality tab under there and there's some excellent information reading on there um, that you can just look up on the net uh, without having to deal with a pesky sales rep um, but definitely Oxygen is uh, a no-no and temperature is a no-no. So it's it's very similar storage conditions to your beer. The lower the oxygen and the lower the temperature, the longer the store. To reseal a bag, because um, you know not many people use a bag in the exact quantity they buy it. So definitely, what my process when I was running a brewery was always to roll it up, evacuate all the oxygen, tape it up to the bejesus, and then I had a deep freezer and I'd put it in there. Um, I was always in SF guys and girls who had like a, um, you know, would be able to purge out with CO2 and then, you know, do a proper, you know, vac seal or something yeah. like that. That's that's awesome. Um, but that's not always available and it's another expense to a brewery. So just keep it as cold as possible with as little oxygen as possible. And make sure you're turning those bags over. Like, you know, a, a bag's only going to stay good for so long once it's open. So try and even schedule your brews around doing two brews or three brews or, you know, uh, a lot of, you know, with the same hop or there, there's a lot of breweries out there, for example, that will only use open bags on the hot side and will only use uh, fresh unopened bags on the dry hop on the cold side. So there's, there's different ways, but certainly managing your hop qualities is paramount to making great beer because if, if you're not managing your hops well and if you're not receiving great hops as well because there's a big bad industry of where they come from there are primary traders secondary traders tertiary traders you know not everyone has ISO and HACCP quality standards so um, you know you understand what you're getting and even to move further back into your field you know have a look at things like what is your um, hop storage index which is your HSI you know if you get a certificate of analysis and you should be looking at a certificate of analysis you're spending a lot of money on hops you're spending let's say 40 50 bucks a kilo on hops have a look at your certificate analysis get an idea for what your alphas are what your oils are but also look at your HSI you know if you're anything above 0.3 0.31 0.33 
have a chat to your hop supplier and say, what do you reckon? Um, but if you start getting, you know, point three five and above, that's where you start going, okay, am I using the right hop here, you know? Uh, talk to your supplier, say, why is the HSI so high? And they should be able to give you the technical information behind. There, there might be a justification why, but they need to be able to provide you with that technical assistance as to why. Okay. So yeah. Excellent. No, great advice there and uh, something I was completely unaware of, um, yep. that HSI index. So just moving on to, I guess, your industry insights and and uh, like I was talking to Hayden from Gladfield in, a, in an earlier episode, he's come from a brewer's background as well. Uh, you know, you've, you've had quite a history on the brewing side, and, you know, uh, I guess a lot of insights on, on the industry as well as the supply side. Do you want to share some uh, insights on what you think the future of the industry is for craft beer or, you know, beer trends or anything you want to go into? Oh, man, I've so, got no idea, hey. Like, no? I don't know. I did not know, like, who uh, who would have thought that hazies and neepers, like, five years ago, no one was thinking about them or brewing them that, that I know of, really. Um, Do you think that no. we're so um, we're so reliant on what the American market is doing? Do you think that we're you know I've had some conversations I can't recall now off the top of my head, but we're we're sort of like five years behind the American market. Whatever they're doing there, it slowly comes over to Australia. I think it used to be like that, and and I know some of the some of the people who really laid the foundations for great beer in in Australia. You know, like. People like the Brendan Viruses or the Richard Watkins, those are people who I've always looked up to and respected a lot. I know they used to go to the States every year and draw inspiration and bring it back to Australia and, you know, create these, you know, first IPAs or first big Baltic porters or barrel aged whiskies or sours or whatever. But I think that the trend moves a lot faster than that now. We're certainly not five years behind them. We're, we're we're reasonably close to them. They've just got so many more breweries. You know, they've got 10,000 breweries. We've got under 1,000 breweries here. They've got, you know, I don't know how many people, 300 million people versus our 25 million. So the, the consumer cycle is very different over there. Um, I think that in Australia, though, uh, I don't think we're five or ten years behind them at all. I think that um, we're, we're a mature enough beer consumer in Australia to know what we want these days. Um, I think, you know, mid-strength beers with good hops are great. I think Hopford is where it's at and where it's going to be at for the medium term at least. Um, but then again, there's so many, like, breweries who are making a mark with, like, massive beers, you know, dry hopped at 25 grams a litre and 8% and, you know, it costs 45 bucks for a four-pack and they're flying out the door. So, yeah. you know, like... Go with go with go with your inspiration. Um, is what I reckon. Yeah, yeah. And uh, how has COVID impacted both HPA and, and, and your thoughts on the industry? Yeah, um, we'll we'll see how it impacts. It's it's been discombobulating to say the least, right? Which is good. We're still in a decent financial position because we've we're going to sell the farm gate this year, which is you know paramount to us. So we've been very fortunate in that respect. But we're we've, we're helping support a lot of brewers and it means that we are taking on a lot more risk in terms of you know spreading taking taking perhaps taking back where we can some hops off someone's contract and figuring out where to sell it afterwards uh you know without the brewers we don't have customers so they are very important um as per the long-term ramifications of covid i just don't know because i still don't think we've been hit by the the full economic impact off COVID in Australia. Um, some venues are just coming off Job Seeker now. Melbourne's still in lockdown. Um, you know, Europe is about to go through its second wave. You know, the first wave we saw a massive pivot from draft to off premise to, to pack. Let's see what this second wave provides. Like, let's see what, what people do then. Are they going to continue to drink because they drank through the first wave? Are they going to drink in Europe for the second wave or are they going to get healthy and start doing a heap of yoga? You know, a yoga match the next big thing. I don't know. Yeah. So, and that's where the constant communication comes in. That's where hop contracts are really important. I guess I haven't uh, emphasised enough how important hop contracts are for the, the grower because it tells a grower, you can still grow that hop in five years' time because yeah. I've got a contract with you in five years' time. So hop contracts have been yeah, impacted pretty dramatically by COVID as well. Mm. And so you mentioned about hop forward beers. Um, so you think that majority, that's what the people in the craft beer industry are, are, are producing now? That's what you think the consumer, craft consumer wants versus malt forward beers? 
Uh, I mean, Hayden probably had a very different answer to me. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> but, I mean, realistically... No, 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 there was no... Well, a malt supply would say that, wouldn't yeah, they? Yeah, yeah, Well, you still need malt to brew the, the hoppiest of hoppy yeah, yeah, beers. Yeah. So, um, but, but what I see out there is... And I guess I can only talk to what I drink, but I like... Uh, I like hop forward beers. When I say hop forward, it doesn't have to be a triple IPA. It can be something with real genuine, excellent flavour. Um, and there's some really unique flavours coming out of the States. There's some new hops. You know, Talus is uh, a hop that's been commercialised by the Hop Breeding Company, which is uh, a JV of which the Bath Haas Company is, uh, is, is one of the two partners in. And um, and that's that's a really impactful hop, but it's more on the tobacco-y, woody, piney side. And I think it's... I think it's can offer a really different flavour. So okay, yeah. excellent. So you, and we'll see where this ends up in the, the whole consumer piece. You know? Yeah. So we will, we expect to maybe see a new hop from HPA, uh, a proprietary hop next year. You reckon? No. Well, we're, we're we're launching one next month. Next month. And it takes sixteen years to yes. find one. So yeah. give us a bit of breathing room. Right. Okay. Um, <laughs> I don't think you'll see one for a few years at least. Let's say. Right. Um, okay. But we've we've got some absolute bangers lined up, ready to go. It's just. You, you can't just let them all out at once, you know. They need to have uh, a viable future before you release them. And can, can and just a quick side note of that, can commercial brewers access those hops before they're on market to, to trial out in their current, uh, I guess it might be a seasonal or whatever, can, can they access some of those hops? A lot of the time they can, and again, yeah. communicating with your rep is really important. So like 016, for example, right, last year we got 400 kilos for the world. And the year before, we got 400 kilos from the world. So we're talking like five kilo lots going into new product development streams of breweries of every scale. And, and you know, from a five kilo sale, that can that can work up to a two-ton contract or something, you know, something that will really go well and give HPA as a company security that this is a good hop to grow. So it was really hard before, but we really tried to distribute it into small breweries. This year we got a really great yield. I think it was around 20 tonnes or so. And a lot of breweries, you know, everyone knew they, a lot of people being told they can have access to it. People probably still don't know they do, but it, it's part of that seeding and growing process. I think once the hop gets its name, then people will, will, will request it a bit more. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Well, we're looking forward to seeing when that gets released. Yeah. Yeah. Have you been involved in the naming process at all or...? Oh, they wouldn't be silly enough to involve me in the naming process. I'll come up with something stupid. Um, But uh, we're doing a really cool beer launch with the guys out at Beer Cartel. Oh, yeah. Um, So we've got 12... uh, It it, it turned out by chance that we've got 12 independent brewers um, that brewed a single hop beer of their choice. And it's going to go into this mixed uh, mixed carton through Beer Cartel. So it's, it's pretty wicked. You know, there's everything from... Wit beers to saisons to triple IPAs to porters to uh, red lagers I think so there's a lot of cool stuff going on it's a really nice way to try uh, see how one hop performs in many different expressions yeah excellent oh, well uh, coming to the end Michael and uh, once again I really appreciate you meeting up with us and sharing a bit of your thoughts to the listeners uh, any closing thoughts and advice for aspiring brewery owners uh, lots but I'll keep it brief uh, with regards to hops communicate with your hop supplier uh, and ask them lots of questions and make sure you extract as much value out of them as they can. They're there to work for you and they want you to succeed. Excellent. And uh, I know we, you had a, an opportunity to plug a couple of the, the new things on the scene with HPA, but anything else you want to talk about, events coming up? or Sure. Yeah. Um, actually, we're sitting in Foghorn right now and this is where the, uh, the New South Wales section of the Indies is going to be judged uh, on the 8th and the 9th. So um, myself and Sean Sherlock, who runs this venue, are both on the, uh, the judging panel for the Independent Brewers Association um, that, that guide the direction of the Indies competition. So uh, three weeks ago, the whole competition was going to be judged in Melbourne and then COVID was just too unsure. So... Uh, for the first time we've managed to, um, and the IBA's done a great job, but we're going to be having judging hubs in West Australia, New, uh, in Perth, in Newcastle and in Brisbane. Um, so those awards, and we've got 700 entries, which is wicked, wow. considering there's a lot of financial pressure on brewers. We got 1,000 entries last year into the Indies, uh, and we're allowing draft. This year there's, uh, there's no draft allowed, only pack, so people really find value in it. Uh, and we've got some great judges. So I think the awards ceremony for Indies is happening around the 15th or 16th of November. So, yeah, look out for that. 
Excellent. Excellent. Well, thanks again, Michael. Uh, Michael from HPA. Thanks for listening to the Bill Me A Brewery podcast. That was part two of the raw materials and ingredient supplies segment. Part two of the segment, I chat with Avi Shavitz from Lalaman Brewing on all things yeast. Such an exciting topic, yeast. We talk about the role it plays in a beer's final flavor and aroma, as well as insights around developing unique house strains for breweries. As always, if you are liking the podcast so far and find the content useful, please give us a follow and rating on whatever platform you're listening on. Also, follow us on all our social media handles as well as visiting our website, www.buildmeabrewery.com.au and much more complimentary content will be coming your way if you sign up to our mailing list. I'm Chris Hayton, your host, and this is the Build Me A Brewery podcast.